Okay, welcome to Building Energy. Today on the show, we are going to be discussing um, subsurface ex exploration programs and, and limiting that environmental footprint of them. It is going to be a great discussion and one I've been looking forward to a long time. It's going to be OptiSize will be on the show. Um, and we're going to have uh, Peter Vermeulen. He is the project manager. And we're also going to have the president and CEO, Andrea Crook, on the show. So very excited. A um, couple quick announcements to everybody. We are doing our heavy industry tour. Um, we may have already been there by the time you see this episode, but we're going to be going to Electra Mining. We're going to Diggers and Dealers in, and, and IMARC in Australia, PowerGen, PDAC, uh, CIM. There's lots of events we're heading to. Um, so if you want to be involved in any of those shows, let us know and we can feature you at the show. The other thing is a ton of you have been subscribing because of the contest, so that's been lots of fun. We're going to be giving away the the... Once we hit the next 1,000 subscribers, we're going to give away um, the Makita drill. So thanks for uh, playing along with that. Just make sure to hit subscribe, and you automatically uh, enter that contest. Okay, let's bring Peter and, uh, Peter and Andrew on. Uh, both of you, welcome to the show. It's great to have you on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, Andrea, I'm going to start with you. OptiSize has been a huge supporter of our show, sponsored many episodes, and is still sponsoring them. Um, and we've been planning this first. This is the first of three episodes that we're going to do with you. So I want to open up the floor to you first to, to just give us that snapshot of who OptiSize is, you know, where it was founded and how it was founded and all those types of things. For sure. So we began the company 11 years ago in order to provide high resolution, cost effective seismic acquisition design services to our clients around the world. Initially, we were focused on just seismic acquisition design using third party software packages, but we found that many of the things we wanted to do to make uh, surface modeling more efficient uh, didn't exist, so we de began developing our own software. Um, as the company has advanced, we have dug really deep into research in seismic acquisition, and we've helped clients bring new innovations into their operations. And we also provide seismic processing QC and geophysical uh, interpretation services. I, I, something that just stood out to me right now, because when I was planning this interview, I've been trying to sort of find out how I'm going to frame it so that, you know, anybody watching the show could sort of understand. And he said something about when you started, you use these off-the-shelf um, softwares and that. Can you give us sort of the contrast? What would an, in 2011, what would have an off-the-shelf off the product look like? Well, they are highly specialized. So what we do when somebody needs to get a subsurface seismic image is we have to figure out um, how to deploy the equipment in the field. So we have our energy source, and then we have our geophone, which is the listening device to detect the sound waves. And we have to figure out how many of the energy sources do we need? How many of the geophones do we need to deploy? How far apart are they going to be? Are they going to be in a line? Are they going to be in a grid? Are they going to be in some sort of irregular distribution? And that's what the software packages help us with. So they can help us model what the subsurface uh, reflectors look like. And then where we really excel is in modeling for all those surface exclusions. So if you have a pipeline or a water well or some sensitive environmental habitat, we need to move the points around there and, and buffer away from the more sensitive areas. Um, some of these programs may have thousands of points to put out on the ground, some of them may have hundreds of thousands. So when you're doing a lot of this manipulation of the data manually, uh, it can take a lot of time. Mm. So we started writing algorithms to automate that process. So you're actually writing the algorithm. Now, so can you tie, I, I've seen, I saw when I was walking through the notes that the seismic survey design um, and, and, and in bold writing, it said, and being target focused. Can you walk us through that, what that means and, and how it relates to what you're delivering? Certainly. So um, I have a slide here that shows some different types of seismic data. You can see some wiggly lines, some colored pictures, some squiggles. This represents different forms of the data and different ways of looking at it. So we might be looking at the data to see uh, the frequency content. So are we getting the low frequencies that are going to help us more with the geology? Are we getting the high frequencies to, to image the thinner layers? 
So, so one of our specialties with our strong background in processing and interpretation is to really dig into the data with the client and understand what they want to use it for. Do they just need a picture of the basic rock structure um, over their target area? Or do they need the more subtle details on the, the fluid properties or, or the specific rock properties and how the oil is going to move through the reservoir? Mm. So our, our approach to design is very uh, target focused in that we want to answer the questions. And in technical terms, that would be a structural interpretation uh, where we might do just post stack processing. That would be very simple. Or it might be a more complex uh, interpretation where we need pre-stack uh, processing as well as uh, quantitative uh, interpretation at the end. E3 Lithium is a lithium resource and technology company aiming to power the growing electrical revolution. Based in Alberta, E3 Lithium's combined resources, including the Clearwater project, are being developed on the backbone of the mature and sophisticated oil and gas industry that will allow the company to accelerate its development. Visit them at e3lithium.ca to learn more. LNH Industrial can custom engineer and build from the ground up any heavy equipment assembly or machine that you need for your operation. Their worldwide 24-7 field services network is on the job whenever you need heavy equipment troubleshooting, repairs, rebuilds, relocations, or replacements. And thanks to their specialized design and engineering and state-of-the-art manufacturing and repair services, they are a go-to international supplier for improved components and custom assemblies for heavy industrial machinery. Visit LNH net to learn more. Um, Andrea, I think it's probably important, uh, you know, before we dig in further, is to just sort of understand industry as well. Wh what industries you're serving and sort of uh, an, at least an overview of what it gets offered specific to those industries. Uh, for sure. So um, as, as you're well aware, our primary uh, clients, when we had first started the business, were in oil and gas. So that was doing like 2D or 3D or 4D uh, seismic surveys for both land, transition zones, and marine. Um, as we've developed the company, we offer also offer VSP and borehole services for oil and gas. And we've helped many clients transition to high density surveys such as um, simultaneous fiber size sources. Now, Exploration for oil and gas with seismic uh, can also be transferred into other uh, industries. Seismic is used in mining as well. And, and this is becoming quite important as we do more exploration for critical minerals that will help with the energy transition. And then a very exciting area that we're actively doing projects for is in the clean tech space. So here we might be doing projects for carbon capture and storage or uh, exploring for helium, hydrogen and lithium or helping with the placement of geothermal projects or wind farms. I see. OK, um, I, I imagine since 2011 um, up until now, I, I've imagined you've done some version of what you're doing here today is explaining, walking us through it. And you sent me an interesting slide. So I want to bring this one up now because it's sort of. I, you, you can clarify what I'm actually looking at, but to me, it looked like almost like this lineage of different presentations that you've you've sort of used to sort of explain the technology and capabilities and that. Um, can you walk us through what I'm looking at here? Certainly. So uh, OptiSize has been very big on bringing new acquisition technologies into Canada. We have a lot of experience in our background uh, with international operations, and uh, Canada has slowly been moving towards uh, adopting more and more of these for their uh, seismic programs. So this slide just shows a, a very quick snapshot of a few of the presentations we've done over the years in different areas of uh, innovations or research on seismic acquisition. We actually have over 20 publications and this slide stops at 2019 because in 2020, we started our most research, uh, recent research project on EcoSize, which we're going to talk to you about uh, in a little bit. Um, and that, I mean, I, you know, with, w without saying the word, we, we kind of all know what's been happening the last couple of years. Was that, was there a big, you know, sort of the story of, uh, of, of your company of OptiSize, has that, did, did, was that, did that sort of spur on some, some major changes or development for you? So um, up until 2020, we had been working with individual clients on research uh, for their uh, specific targets. 
And some of the technologies we were exploring with them and some of the contractors, we saw that that would fit in very well with our geometry uh, technologies that we were developing. So because we have our own software, we can test out a lot of uh, different geometry iterations. This is something we've been working on since those decimation tests in 2013. And we had uh, entered some technology competitions at the beginning of 2020 to showcase the uh, new ideas with EcoSize that we were developing. And then when the industry slowdown happened, we had the opportunity to do a deep dive into the research. And, and that's been very exciting. Okay. Um, I, I mean, I know EcoSize is a, is a huge thing for your company and for the industry. So I want to jump into that quite quickly here into the interview. Um, but I just want to kind of... We're going to, because this is part one of three interviews that we're going to be doing with you, um, I just wanted to sort of, can you, I know, I think the second or third episode, we're really going to dig into the software, but Andrea, before we jump over to Peter, can you just give us that sort of overview of the software part of it? Sure. So um, the reason we developed our software, as I mentioned earlier, is because we needed tools to make our job easier. So our software is developed by the seismic acquisition designer for seismic acquisition designers. And this is the, I think the key advantage of it. Uh, when we run into a problem with other packages or we have a new idea that needs implementing quickly, uh, we work with our coders to get that implemented um, right away. And that makes uh, our response time with our clients much faster on the projects that we do. The, the software is, focused primarily on uh, surface modeling, mm. as well as theoretical design. We don't do all the subsurface ray tracing. And that's where the eco size geometries come in is on the surface side. So how to lay out these irregular geometries, how to deal with the sensitive habitats, how to efficiently move stations or decide do you really need to spend money on stations in this location mm. or could we save some costs by removing those and putting or putting them someplace else? So I think that's a kind of a quick, basic overview. And uh, Allison on one of the next episodes will be able to go into it in a lot more detail with you. Um, OK, Peter, uh, let's bring you into the discussion. So I'm going I'm to read off words and, and not pretend to uh, to understand things I don't. And I'll let you explain it. So. Um, I, I've seen the term processing, QC, and geophysical interpretation. Um, can you start? Can you sort of walk us through what that means and how it relates to OptiSize? Sure. Um, at OptiSize, we're uh, imaging experts, um, so we know how to put your targets into focus. And um, what we offer is we offer uh, our clients a processing flow that's well suited to the geometries that we design for them. Um, so we help them along with um, some of the newer technologies that are involved with processing and uh, let them know if this is, is right for their, um, for their um, data. Um, if our clients want to test um, acquisition designs on existing data sets, we can also um, pull that data apart and run those tests through processing. And also, if we want to test different field parameters uh, for our clients to optimize their next programs, we can also do that. So, okay, I want, I want to kind of circle back to something that you said. So if the, let's say they have existing data. This is part of that, that you can actually let... So they've already done that, and you know, we'll get into it, you know, the, the old way of clearing out the whole space and doing it. They've already collected all this data. You're able to help come and sort of redo that data in a, in a less complicated way? Uh, not necessarily less complicated, but uh, definitely bringing um, new algorithms, new processing mm -hmm. algorithms um, to the workflow um, and uh, maximize the, uh, the frequency content that they um, have within the data, reduce the noise um, uh, content within that data, and just give them a cleaner, crisper image. So when you say, you know, like, eliminate the noise, what, what, is, what would be an example of that? Well, there's a number of uh, uh, sources of noise within the field. So um, a lot of our clients um, are operating um, within areas that they're producing oil. Um, so you've got either a, a, a big um, 
central processing facility that's operating that's generating steam and 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 separating the bitumen mm. from the uh, from the liquids, or you've got um, pumping stations, or um, you could have ambient noise uh, throughout the program. So wind can generate noise when you when you move vegetation, um, or you could you know, be acquiring your seismic near uh, a highway, uh, which generates some noise. So we can help them um, through the processing flow, pull out all that noise and, um, and get a, a much cleaner um, data of their target. Okay, I think, I think maybe I'm a, a little bit touched closer to understanding it. Um, so when you're I'll relate to something I maybe understand a little bit better. So if I'm, if, if you know, we're in sound, we're in here in a studio, and different mics will pick up different EQs, and you can sort of filter it out. So yours, your program, what you're doing is you're you're developing these such advanced algorithms that you can basically, is the algorithm basically able to identify anything, not just what should be there, but what shouldn't be there, and you're continually developing it based on the environment you're targeting. Is that, am I kind of getting close? Uh, yes, you are. Yeah, that's exactly right. So um, the processing um, packages or uh, providers, I guess, there's, uh, there's a number of different, um, you know, companies that process seismic data. They all offer a different suite of algorithms to, um, you know, to increase the quality of the data um, through their whole processing workflow. And that's exactly right. So uh, they can uh, extract out the data that's not supposed to be there, that has been identified as noise, um, and just leave the data that is supposed to be there, the reflections from the different geology um, that we're trying to image. And that's, and, that, and Andrea sort of mentioned it earlier, that's that part of every environment is different. So you're having to, I would assume then, sometimes quite quickly, um, but you sort of need to put it, you almost need to build a new algorithm a lot of the time for a new environment then because they're so different. Well, it's, it's not necessarily the algorithm algorithm that's being changed. It's the, the um, sequence of those algorithms that are, mm. are being changed. So um, in some cases you need to run more noise attenuation, um, you know, to get more of that data out or different kinds of noise attenuation. Um, to get that noise out of the data, um, and um, this is this is the type of thing that we help our clients uh, with with their particular data sets. So, Andrea, I, I really want to get into EcoSize, and there's there's some very technical discussion that we need to have on that. Um, but I just kind of just something that came to my mind uh, during this interview is is just this sort of that you touched on the different industries that you service. Um, is there a lot of education required, um, like in the oil and gas, is it fairly well known and then mining, is it more of, you know, a lot more education needed to sort of let people know what you're offering? Seismic acquisition is quite common in oil and gas. We've been using it for decades. Um, but in mining and clean energy applications like carbon capture and geothermal, Often we're working in areas where we may not have existing seismic and we may have limited data on what's in the subsurface. So there we do need to do uh, a bit more work with the client to ensure they understand uh, what the data is going to give them and what it's not, because there are, are limitations on the seismic acquisition technology. And what we do as well, uh, and we've been doing for years, is we provide seismic acquisition design courses. So I teach for both the local uh, Canadian Society of Exploration Geophysicists, oh. as well as the international chapter. And uh, we offer basic and advanced courses on seismic acquisition to get everybody up to speed on the uh, latest and greatest in the field. Okay. So again, sorry for the layman, I'll, I'll let this, either one of you ask this question, uh, answer this question. Um, so then going back to, is it a different, is it a completely different set of parameters then if you're going on to a mining operation as opposed to uh, on the, in the oil and gas sector or, or, or are there, is there a lot of overlap and similarities of the data that you're eliminating the noise and that type of thing? Yeah, I would say that the geophysics is going to be the same because we're, we're imaging the subsurface. The types of rocks will be different. So we have to adjust the parameters for how fast the sound waves travel through the rocks. 
uh, some mining applications, we may have rocks with very high velocities. Uh, and then I think the biggest thing is not really necessarily an oil and gas or mining or geothermal question, but more a depth of imaging question. Mm. So, uh, and, and Peter's going to touch on this when he starts talking about eco size, because we're doing our test in an area with very shallow targets on the order of hundreds of meters, whereas some deeper targets may be on the order of uh, you know, thousands of meters. So when we're trying to image something that's very shallow, it's, it's like focusing um, one of the old uh, cameras where you can focus on your near, but we need to bring our geometry much tighter. And then if we're focusing on the far or the deep, we can uh, push our geometry parameters much larger. Okay, let, let's jump into eco size. I, we're, we, I think we've teased out the audience. <laughs> so, um, Ken, Andrea, let's let's start with you. Let's give it that overview, and and once that's done, then maybe if you could hand it off to to Peter to sort of tee up the technical discussion that we're going to have about eco size. So, in its simplest form, eco size is a land footprint reduction technology. And it allows uh, the client to focus on environmental, greenhouse gas, and subsurface targets. So when we acquire a seismic program, we have to cut trees. The fewer trees that we cut, the lower environmental footprint, uh, the less equipment we deploy in the field, the fewer greenhouse gas emissions. But when we're reducing those two things, we also have to consider the quality of the data in the image that we're mm -hmm. getting. So EcoSize is designed to reduce the land footprint, reduce the emissions. It has the potential to reduce cost, all while maintaining subsurface data quality. Okay, so that that's the overview. So, so I guess just to just to contrast. So the old way of doing it is you'd have to go and basically clear out the entire environment that you wanted seismic data on. Is that right? Simply put. No, it's, it's, it's not like mining where we're going to strip everything off the surface. Rather, we have to cut, if we're in the forest, we would cut paths through the forest to deploy a grid of lines. So for oh, a shallow I target, see. like we were talking about, we might have a line to put equipment on, cut, let's say every 100 meters. But if we were looking for something deeper, we might cut a line every 200 or 300 meters. So the target depth has an impact. Mm. And if we're in a sensitive habitat that doesn't have trees, but let's say, you know, it's a protected species of lizard or sage grouse, then we're trying to reduce our overall footprint and how much equipment we deploy in that area. Okay. So, so it's a way to, to overall reduce the environmental impact of the seismic. Proton Technologies is currently leading the way for hydrogen to be the future of low-cost, low-environmental impact and carbon emission-free hydrogen production. By deploying their patent and production technology, they repurpose legacy oil and gas assets into upstream production of clear hydrogen. From carbon taxation to abandoned assets, their process for hydrogen production helps mitigate the many consequences of ongoing energy transition towards achieving a net-zero environmental footprint. Look to the future. Look to Proton technologies for clean, low-cost hydrogen. Visit them at proton.energy. Introducing the SolarSet Fold. The new foldable frame solar system brings power to your residential and commercial property and can be shipped worldwide. Like all SolarSet products, the SolarSet Fold comes turnkey, pre-assembled, and is easily transported and installed. Learn more about SolarSet Fold and their full line of amazing solar systems at solarset.com. Andrew, could you just expand on that a little bit more? Just sort of the, you know, like the cutting through the lines, the, 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 you know, the way it used to be, the way it is now. Could you just expand and sort of just walk us through a little bit more? Sure. So uh, if we look back, you know, 20, 30, 40 years, when they were cutting these seismic lines in forests, they're often using a cat to push through the forest and the lines could be like eight to 10 meters wide. So they could put actual trucks down the line. With our modern seismic activities now, uh, and you can see this in the picture here, we've moved to mulchers that mulch the lines a lot narrower, let's say three to four meters. And we're using, you can see here, quads, snowmobiles to deploy equipment. So it's a much lower footprint. We're not trying to drive a pickup truck down these lines anymore. The problem with this though, if we go to the next slide, you can see this grid here mm -hmm. that has 
red source cut lines. So we're going to put our energy source on these lines and then the blue lines that we're putting the geophones or the receivers on. And there's a little picture that shows in winter. So you can clearly pick up and see these lines. Mm. It's an orthogonal pattern and you can see these squares of cut lines all over the forest. So this is what we want to re reduce. And there are ecological reasons for that, which Peter is going to walk you through in this video, which is an overview of a seismic program. Okay, let's bring that up then. Yeah. and. In this video, we've got a high density ortho orthogonal seismic uh, program uh, in Northern Alberta. And the cut lines fracture the forest. And in all but the highest uplands, these cut lines are extremely slow to regrow. The cut lines disturb habitats, which in turn disrupts the predator-prey relationships. Um, this leads to an imbalanced species po population and the cut lines also contribute to increased GHG emissions through the removal of the canopy, um, soil compaction, and also the emissions from the mulchers that cut them. Okay, so now, Andrea, um, can you build off of that now to sort of tie it together to, to sort of clearly outline, and I know there's a few slides too that I want to bring up as well, to sort of what the solution you're offering um, and sort of laid out for the audience in a clear way. Okay, I'm going to walk you through kind of the conventional program and then some of the eco size uh, op options. Okay. So we start off with a conventional seismic program. Uh, this is Alberta. We're assuming a forested area, so we're cutting lines. And again, we see these red source lines and these blue receiver lines. They're all intersecting. If all we do is make those lines narrower, we can reduce the amount of cutting on the program by 22%, but this doesn't address some of the issues Peter brought up, like the, the fragmentation of the forest. So another idea is, well, what if we just cut the lines in one direction and we put all the equipment on those lines? And this is a type of survey that is used in industry at times, but it doesn't work if we just go from our orthogonal lines directly to these wide lines. To get a good image in the subsurface, we actually have to put the lines closer together. So there is a bit of a footprint reduction, but not much. We could look at cutting the lines narrower, but now we need to use specialized equipment. So we may just be stuck with an 8% footprint reduction. Mm. Now what EcoSize is looking at is we take this concept of the straight lines and we want to improve the subsurface image. So in order to do that, we need a bit of cross line or, you know, squiggly wiggles on the line so that we can get better data in the subsurface. So this shows some ideas of different ways you could cut the lines with, uh, you know, a hexagonal, zigzag, sinusoidal. And this shows the percentage reduction in total cut area with these different types uh, with a wide line versus a narrower line. So what we've done is uh, we've taken an existing data set and we're decimating it into these different geometries. So we can take the data set, you can see we can generate all these different geometries, but you'll notice when we write the numbers on here, the 60, 40, 80, 60, that's the distance between the lines. So what we need to test is the idea of using lines works, but are we going to get a good image in the subsurface? Okay, so then when you then when uh, I guess that's a question, and then the question is how do you validate that? Is is that sort of the next? Uh, if you're talking to a customer, is that the next question they have? Yeah, so we so we can show statistically that we get a good footprint reduction on the surface, but they need to be able to see examples of the data. And Peter's going to walk you through that as he's been through what is it twenty different iterations of data sets now, Peter? Yeah, it's been quite a few. Uh, so the way we do this is we want to treat these, uh, these eco-sized geometries as if they were uh, real data sets that um, an explorationist would use um, to look for oil and gas. Um, so there's a, there's a, definite workflow, a definite workflow that they need to go through, and it starts with our design analysis. And so for each of the geometries, um, we compared... Um, the Fresnel fold, we compared trace densities. We looked at the offsets and azimuth distribution that each of these geometries gave. And we also went through the full workflow 
um, from processing all the way to quantitative analysis. Uh, so in processing, uh, we wanted to see that the image quality was uh, the same as if it was shot conventionally or with an orthogonal uh, a geometry. And then we went through a interpretation of the data sets. So we identified the different reflectors um, and we identified the target of interest. And we looked at the, the, the different properties of those horizons. Um, so we looked at uh, the amplitude of those horizons. We looked at the phase, we looked at the frequency um, and we compared them to the orthogonal to see if we were getting the same uh, result, a better result or, or a worse result. And then we started to rank the, the eco size geometries um, <clears throat> to determine which ones were actually going to be um, beneficial to provide us with the same level of data quality that the client expects. So again, this is that mirroring approach where you have this data set so you know and now you can now you can validate that no, we are getting the same through but with with less impact. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So um, of the 20 data sets that we worked through, um, <clears throat> there was probably about four or five that we high graded um, that really uh, matched the quality um, that the um, client would get with a conventional program. But now they could use EcoSize and reduce their environmental footprint, uh, reduce the GHG emissions. Um, and get all the benefits that OptiSize is, is, is offering with EcoSize. Andrea, you're, you're the president and CEO of the company. Um, and um, I mean, our, our company is built off of guest after guest coming and sponsors and it's a whole, and, and, and you're a very different type of company, but I, I would imagine um, that it takes a lot of different partnerships, especially when you're, Whenever you're improving something, you're trying to improve it drastically. I mean, it takes adoption, it takes research, it takes people being willing to share data with you, all that sort of stuff. Can you talk us to that process? Um, because it's it's an easy thing to just kind of, you know, yeah, partners are great and, and spend two minutes on, but it's it's such an important thing, especially with what you're doing. So can you walk us through that? Yes, um, I'm going to walk you through the timeline of the EcoSize project because it's it's kind of interesting how it's all come together. So we we had ideas from you know we started the company in 2011 up till 2020. We'd been working on lots of these different geometry ideas, and we'd done individual tests with clients. And at the beginning of 2020, we there was a clean tech alliance challenge put on by Imperial to look yeah. at all sorts of different technologies that reduce environmental footprint. So we submitted our technology to that challenge in January of 2020. And then unfortunately, as you know, a lot of stuff shut down in industry in 2020. So yeah. there was a big slowdown and that uh, tech challenge was uh, delayed for about eight months. So as a result, um, we had the idea we knew about uh, programs like Alberta Innovates uh, program that can help companies develop new technology. So we took equal size phase one idea to them. And we also talked with some oil companies and we ended up raising enough money through COSIA, a partnership with COSIA, Alberta Innovates, IRAP and ourselves to work through EcoSize phase one, which um, as we've been talking was utilizing data sets that the oil companies donated and then going through these processing tests and also working through the environmental side. In uh, spring of last year, we presented some of the results at the COSIA challenge and EcoSize placed second in the challenge. This led to submitting our technology to uh, CRIN for phase two. And uh, the CRIN, in case you're not uh, familiar with them, they are the um, Clean Resources Innovation Network. And they have sponsored 50% of our first pilot project. So we went through all the desktop studies and now what we're going to be working on is going and testing this technology in the field. So part of the money for that came from CRIN and the rest came from our oil company sponsors, ourselves, Alberta Innovates and IRAP. 
So the goal at the end of this project, uh, which will involve acquiring field data and then going through those processing and quantitative interpretation uh, analyses, as well as all the emissions calculations, is to take the technology from a technology readiness level of six up to a technology readiness level of eight upon completion of the project in 2024. It, it must have been quite a journey for you, Andrea. Like, is it what is it? I I I see how you laugh at that. The um, is it? Has there been something that was a challenge? And I mean, there are going to be people watching that are are going, okay. Well, how did you get through all that? Is there been something that a skill set that you brought um through the years that has made one part of it easier that may have been more difficult for other people? And is there something that really, uh, really has been a challenge for you o over the years, um, whether it's, you know, a communication, developing partnerships, developing the technology? What has sort of been what has sort of been the strength that you've been able to, to sort of carry as a through line and what's been a, a challenge that you've run into? So we have already been working with uh, several clients uh, for a few years mm -hmm. on uh, testing out new innovations. And in the background, we've been working on our own geometry in our software. So it was kind of the, the perfect marriage to bring that all together. Right. But you're right, it does take time to negotiate contracts, understand the legalities of the IP and the data, sh uh, data ownership, and then get rights to, to share all this information. So um, it, it takes time to put that together. Um, when working with granting agencies, again, there's quite extensive application processes. So we, we need to look at the overall benefits of the technology. Um, that, that's one of the questions that, they, that comes up quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and so what is, what is the next step uh, for you uh, as an organization, as a company? You kind of walk through, you know, getting these results, getting from a six to an eight and um, but sort of as an overall objective over the next few years, what are you looking at as a team? Yeah, so so I can go through that in a bit more detail. Um, we've we've completed uh, all the desktop studies, uh, and we are now preparing for field operations. So seismic acquisition field operations typically take, you know, the fastest might be three months, but often six to nine months to put these projects together. Because we need to bring in multiple contractors, often there, there could be up to 100 people in the field. Uh, in Canada, these programs typically have to be run in winter because we need the ground to be frozen. So we will be acquiring uh, the data this winter and we're going to acquire it, uh, the eco-size data, along with some conventional seismic data so that we can do that direct one-to-one -one comparison both for the technical aspects, are we getting a good image, as well as the operational aspects. Um, how easy is it to deploy EcoSize in the field? Um, and how much of a reduction do we see in the costs and the emissions? Once uh, we've acquired uh, that, there's gonna be a lot of work for Peter and the rest of the team as we need to get the data processed, uh, go through the full analysis of that, go through all the environmental tests. Oh. And actually, I forgot, we are also involved in some environmental studies mm. because um, we know that if we cut fewer lines, there's a lower environmental um, impact. But the way we cut the lines and the types of habitat we're in also have an impact. So as, tree to, uh, as Peter mentioned, some trees will regrow very quickly. In other habitats, they won't grow very fast. So we're actually this summer doing a 20-year regrowth study on existing seismic cut lines. Wow. So rather than going and doing the test and waiting 20 years, we're working with data sets where the lines were cut 20 years ago and we're assessing how they regrow. And um, we have biologists working on that and expect to publish some papers on that and then incorporate that into EcoSize uh, because we can modify the geometry for different habitat types. So we don't have to use the same geometry across the whole area. But to, to answer your question a little more succinctly, at the end of the day, we'll have done an operational validation, the full technical evaluation, and we'll have everything coded into the software so that it's very easy for people to create their own eco size program based on the current geometries they're using uh, to image their targets. What kind of team does it take to put together what you're doing with so many different elements and such it is so technical? Um, what, is, it, is there sort of a through line of what everybody sort of has as like even an educational background or do you need a, a lot of different, uh, very specific skill sets put together? 
Well, um, we do need a lot of different skill sets and it would be unrealistic to expect one person to have all of them. So um, can I walk you through the, the people on our team? Sure. Well, and it's a good opportunity because we are going to be doing more shows. So I, 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 it's also kind of an opportunity to introduce some of the people that might be coming on on the next episode as well. So yes, please. All right. So um, let's go in alphabetical order. So I'd like to introduce Alison Burse, and she's our software manager, but Alison comes with a very unique skill set. She's a geophysicist. She has a degree in GIS, uh, and she is also working on her computer science degree. So she brings a lot of knowledge and understanding of the subsurface geophysics, as well as all the surface GIS data, data. because you can imagine we have to work with different types of habitats, um, you know, different exclusions. Do we have pipelines, power lines, stuff on the surface? And then she works very closely with our software developer to put this all together into the software package. Um, you've met myself, Andrea. Um, so my background is in geophysics and also in business. Uh, so my specialty is seismic acquisition design with some processing. I've, I've worked in both areas. But uh, I don't necessarily have a lot of expertise in uh, uh, interpretation or deep dive into the research. Mm. So we hired uh, Mustafa Nagizade. Um, he's a geophysicist and he is our senior researcher. So Mustafa has done research in seismic acquisition and extensive research on seismic processing, particularly on interpolation which is critical when we're dealing with these alternative geometries. So um, as part of the Equisize uh, project, Mustafa is working on the uh, processing, developing new algorithms and new geometries. And in fact, he's previously published on some geometries he's developed, and then working with our university partners on ongoing research. Peter joined our company uh, initially as a consultant to work on Equisize, given his extensive knowledge in geophysics uh, and interpretation for the oil sands. And now he is also the project manager. So he has a geophysics degree and project management uh, designation. And he's responsible for putting together the overall field operations and keeping us on track as we go through everything. And you can imagine there's a lots of balls to juggle on that. I, I would imagine, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then once uh, the data goes through processing, uh, Peter will be the one going through the interpretation. Oh, okay. And we're also going to work with our oil sands partners on that. But um, everybody's running very lean operations and may not necessarily have the um, geophysical horsepower to do that in-house. So we're going to be working on the data sets ourselves as well as with the, uh, the client interpreters. Okay. And then uh, Stephanie Ross uh, is with us as a processing consultant. She has over 40 years of experience in uh, processing seismic data. Now, we are not a processing company per se, the, there's companies that do that, but we do have the ability to pull the data sets apart internally and look at them from a processing perspective to provide guidance as we go through the uh, processing process. And then uh, we also have Cameron Crook, who is our CEO, and uh, Randy Kolasar, who is our software developer. And um, Cameron is providing some business uh, advice and oversight on the project. And then Randy is working very closely with Allison at completing all the software development. So to wrap up the, the interview, who are we going to see on the next uh, two episodes? Or has we that been decided? Are, <laughs> am, I, am, I, am I jumping We are, we are working on that, but uh, expect to see uh, Mustafa to do a deep dive into the research as well as into other applications for uh, seismic acquisition as he has a background in mining geophysics and also uh, Alison Burse uh, on the software side. So she's going to be doing a deep dive with you into all the technicalities of the software. Uh, I want to thank you both for coming on. It's uh, and again, I'm very glad where this is one of three. We're going to cover a lot. We're going to sort of and we're going to get the opportunity to sort of put all three together, like on a playlist, so people can watch it as we film them. Um, so much to cover. It's it's so interesting what you're doing, and and thank you for sort of being willing to let me ask questions and sort of walk through it at my own pace. Um, it, it's it's going to be very exciting doing more episodes. And again, thank you. Uh, 
you know, Andrea, for this, the support of our show. Uh, um, and we look forward to having you back on. Thank you very much. We've enjoyed ch- talking with you. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for watching Building Energy. Uh, there will be more coming from OptiSize. Uh, we're going to have lots of links to EcoSize and information that's been shared. Um, please keep subscribing, keep supporting, uh, bringing uh, different guests to us. It's such an important part because we don't, we don't want to end up talking about the same thing every time we want to encompass what the energy sector is. And OptiSize is obviously a huge part of, of what makes it so important with the you know, ESG reductions and more efficiency in the industry and everything like that. So thank you. We will see you on the next episode of Building Energy.